I'm François Matarasso. I'm a community artist and a writer and a researcher based in the UK and France. And I'm going to talk today about art and social change, which is a field that I have worked in for 40 years this year um, uh, as a community artist, mostly, but also working as a consultant and researcher and advisor to other people's projects. I work freelance and so and I pretty much always have, so I'll, I will speak from my own perspective. Let me share this presentation. OK. So art and social change. I'm going to talk quite generally about this topic, but I'm going to try and root those general ideas in some specific experiences and mostly that will be clear from the the photographs that i will show including this one uh, which is from a project called the portland inn project in stoke-on-trent in the uk stoke-on-trent is a a former industrial city with a history of mining and steelworks but especially is famous for working for its potteries. And there are still a few small potteries in Stoke-on-Trent, but a lot of the, the companies uh, have moved elsewhere. Uh, and the city is left with the legacy of its industrial past and finding a way uh, to create a new future. The Portland Inn project is uh, an idea and a project run by the woman that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen in a dark bluey green top. She's called Anna Francis. She's an artist and she lives in this neighborhood. And with another artist, she's taken over uh, an abandoned pub and is using it as a space for community oriented arts activities with the local neighborhood. So it's very emblematic of the kind of work that I have been involved in, in terms of art that is intended to produce social change. Um, so I'm going to talk about four things uh, today. First of all, what do we understand by art and culture? Secondly, why do we believe that art has social power? I want to look at art as a human right. And finally, come to the practical questions of how art can change life. Before we, we talk about how art can bring about social change, indeed if it can, it's important that we understand what we mean by art and culture. The two words are often interchangeable, but I think of them as, as different. Uh, I think they have um, a relationship with each other, but they're not the same. And one of the difficulties I think we have is that we generally believe that we know what we think by art and culture and we know and that other people know what they think and often that that's the same in fact i think it's very much not the same so i'm going to outline some of my thinking so first of all culture what is culture um culture is the way we do what we need to do we all need to do we need, as human beings, we need to feed ourselves, we need to stay warm, we need to have shelter, we, we have emotional and intellectual needs. We can satisfy those needs in all kinds of ways, but how we satisfy them is shaped partly by where we, where we live, so in different environmental conditions, in different parts of the world, human beings have invented different ways of meeting their uh, physical and uh, emotional needs. With familiarity, those everyday practices, the things, the way in which we do, the things that we need to do to live and feel well, become invested with meaning. So those habits start to acquire meaning and they become tradition and begin to define ideas of community. So some aspects of how we dress, what we eat, become special, even sacred associations and are consequently accepted or rejected 
as deliberate conscious acts of culture. This is a, an, an example from my own village in France. It's a, a communal meal. And this is now recognized uh, uh, as, um, as a uh, part of the world's intangible heritage. The gastronomic meal of the French was inscribed in 2010 on the representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity by UNESCO. This is everyday culture. It's the culture that we mostly don't think about. Um, and when we do think about it, more importantly, we largely don't question it. It simply becomes, um, uh, it is part of our identity, part of our, of our, social, um, our social fabric. There is other, part of, other parts of culture which are more conscious. Um, this is an example uh, of a religious procession in Barcelona, in Catalonia, that happens on a particular day of the year when the Madonna, which you can perhaps just see in the distance, she's uh, being carried on a bed of flowers, a statue of the Madonna is being carried with music uh, around the, the streets of Barcelona. Obviously, unlike the meal, um, which a lot of people will take part in without even really thinking about it, and certainly not thinking I am now participating in culture. This is still, this is a much more conscious expression of culture. And the, 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 the reenactment on an annual basis of this procession is an affirmation, a conscious affirmation of a cultural identity and a cultural tradition that is passed on from one generation to the next. And all of the signs that you can see, uh, the dress, the, the, the music that's being played, the procession itself, are intended to communicate meaning uh, and to imbue this activity and the people who conduct this activity with particular importance. Um, culture is an enormous field. As I said, it's everything we do that we don't really uh, need to do for uh, reasons of survival, but we feel compelled to do in order to, to be human. But of course, most of culture is taken for granted. If we had to think about what, what for example, if we had to think every morning, uh, uh, why do in some cultures women wear uh, dresses and men wear trousers? And what does it mean if I put trousers on or if I put a skirt on this morning? We would never get out of the house. Um, so all of these cultural habits and choices we take for granted and we just accept them most of the time. Art is different. Art, at least since the the idea of art that was that emerged in the European Enlightenment in the late 18th century, that uh, what we mean by art in those terms is different from culture in a number of ways. But the most important to me and from from in the context of what I'm talking about, the most important difference is that art is questioning. Unlike culture, which is largely unself-conscious, art is self-conscious and it asks questions about the meanings that are being created. Art is very often seen and described and talked about and thought about as a, as a class of things, a, a taxonomy of things. So sometimes that may be seen as forms like visual art or music or theatre or at a more uh, concrete level as objects. So a sculpture is art um, but a wheel is not art. They're both uh, object, one serves a purpose, the other largely doesn't, or at least it pretends that it doesn't serve a purpose. And of course, the difficulty is when you have uh, uh, artists in the 20th century putting found objects into galleries and calling them sculptures, they are challenging our ideas of what sculpture is and consequently of what art is. This way of thinking about art, I think, is unhelpful. It has, uh, it is, was never very helpful when it was invented during the Enlightenment. The original classification of fine arts in the Enlightenment was uh, exactly that, a taxonomy of things. So music, architecture, sculpture, painting, uh, poetry were the original fine arts. 
And the art world has struggled ever since because human beings keep inventing new ideas and new forms of art that the art world has to try and fit into this taxonomy. Uh, so when photography came along, it had to decide, is this an art? It's not painting, but what is it? Uh, the same with new forms of music. Is jazz an art form? Uh, 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 is it a fine art? The art world has consequently spent an enormous amount of time and effort and intellectual uh, 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 investment in trying to police the boundaries of what is art and what isn't and what should be seen as valuable and what should not. I want to propose an alternative way of thinking about art, which is simply this. The art is an act with specific intentions. In other words, when we create art, we do so for a very specific intention. I say create because the act of art brings something into existence which did not previously exist. The art is in the act, not the thing that was brought into existence. So a sculptor creates a sculpture and that is a creative act. Something exists which did not. Even when Picasso puts the handlebars and a saddle of a bicycle together and creates a sculpture of a bull's head, he's creating something that did not previously exist, even though the two objects that form that sculpture did previously exist. Um, the point is, Picasso is, uh, in, in making that uh, sculpture of a bull's head out of bicycle parts, is acting in the world with a specific intention. That intention is about making meaning. It is about saying, this is how I understand the world. This is what I imagine. So even in something as simple as making a bull's head out of bicycle parts, Picasso is making all kinds of meanings. One of the meanings is about the what a bull means in Spanish culture. He didn't make a sheep's head, he made a bull's head. And that is to do with the nature of the bull in uh, the, the uh, in Spanish culture as an animal, as a uh, it, it connects with the bullfight and all of the the meanings that are, have been created by human beings around this animal in the particular context of Spain in the last uh, few hundred years. But he's also making meanings about uh, what it is to be art and who can make art and how it's made. So it is constructing. Uh, uh, when you make art, you are trying to make a meaning out of your experience, out of your imagination, and then you are trying to communicate that meaning to someone else. Here is another example. This is a, an example from the National Museum of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, and the, the title of the, of the project was called I Am the Museum. The, uh, the artwork is not the tiger. Obviously, a tiger is not an artwork. A tiger is a being, a creature. Uh, even when it becomes uh, uh, a stuffed tiger, as this one is, uh, it is at best um, an object. The artwork is the photograph here that came out of a project organised by supporters of the National Museum of uh, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina in Sarajevo. An artwork that, that was partly a political campaign in protest at the neglect of the museum, which had not received any funding for months and eventually years because of the political dispute among the government, the entities, the political parties of the government of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And that left the people who were employed by the museums, the curators, the technicians, the custodians, it left them without pay, without resources. It forced the closure of the museum. But what those people did was to preserve the museum as a symbol of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and its culture and its identity. And so this artwork is a photograph of a curator looking after a derelict museum that cannot function. And in taking this photograph, the photographer and the artists around and the campaign are creating meaning out of a situation. They are saying, 
this is important and it's wrong that it should be happening like this. And that's what I mean by making art as an act in the world, an act of meaning that intends to communicate and because it intends to communicate, also intends to bring about change. So in that sense, if you understand art as an act in the world, then what you, what you are almost inevitably uh, uh, having to accept in that act of creating meaning, there is an intention to bring about social change. So this is a summary of what I've, I've just said, and it is the, the, the idea that will run through what I, will, what I will say from here. And this is another image also from former Yugoslavia, but in this case, it's from uh, Zagreb, from Croatia, and it's a project called Dotracina Virtual Museum. Um, it's a, a, a project led by uh, an artist called Sasha Simpraga and others. And once a year, among other things, they uh, commission an artist to make a work in Dotracina Memorial Park. Well, Dotracina was a park in Zagreb, which was the site of execution for many opponents of the fascist Ustasha regime during the Second World War. After the war, it became a uh, memorial park under the communist uh, regime to honor the victims uh, who had been executed there. But since in the decades since, it has become a neglected and controversial space, uh, at least in the views of the people behind the Dr. China Virtual Museum project. And this, the photographs that you can see is of a, an artist commission where the, the artist invited people to come and stand uh, in a sunlit spot in the woodland in the park on the National Human Rights Day in September and stand for 30 minutes at three o'clock in a sunlit spot. And that was the name of the intervention. And remember, remember the people who might, for whom this might have been a final moment. It's a very moving, a very simple artistic intervention and about a hundred people joined in. It in effect cost virtually nothing to do, but it is exactly what I mean, an artistic act to create and communicate meaning. This at another, in another way is a, an equally powerful artistic act, a very personal one that was created, it's a photograph that was created by um, a person in a project that I was involved in, in working on about 30 years ago. He was a person living in a psychiatric hospital and as part of, of that, that work, he worked with a photographer called Ross Boyd to create a series of images. Uh, he was also a passionate poet and he wrote a lot of poems uh, that I think were some of which were, were extraordinary as part of the project as well. And this image, as you can see, it's the simplest thing in the world. Um, it's something that he saw and that spoke to him and that now 30 years afterwards can speak to strangers. And that is what art is. It's the creation of meaning through an artistic act. So why do we believe that art has social power? That belief has existed since at least classical times. Uh, Aristotle, Plato, other Greek philosophers wrote about the importance and power of art and partly because they feared it, they sought to control it, to impose structures on it, social structures. Um, here is in a way out of slightly uh, to one side, an explanation of why I think art has social power or part of the reason. This is from a book uh, by an American philosopher called Hermeneutics, which is the, if you like, the, the science of the study of interpretation. And he writes, every matter of fact 
is a matter of the interpretation that picks out the facts. What he's saying is, it's not, there are facts and there are interpretations. There are facts and there are meanings of facts. There, there, is, there are objects and there is art. And it is not true to say that everything in life is an interpretation. Um, it is certainly a fact that the earth goes round the sun and not, as the ancient Greeks thought, the sun going round the earth. But what we consider to be a fact, what we look at and what we don't look at, the facts we choose to give importance to and the facts we don't choose to give importance to is always an interpretation. And those interpretations are how we construct social reality. So the park in Dotrachina has existed in Zagreb for decades, and it has been used in different ways at different times. But it is also a place of stories, a place of meanings, and sometimes those meanings are imposed by the state under Yugoslavia, the Dotrachina Park was renamed a memorial park. It becomes part of a narrative about uh, the war and history and the, and the meaning of history. And then after the Yugoslav state, it becomes treated differently because different narratives are dominant. All of those are interpretations and art is used continually to create interpretations, to create meanings and who controls those meanings is really, really important. Nowadays, it's easy to go to a classical concert and listen to an oratorio by Bach and not to think about the religious purpose of that oratorio. But Bach only wrote his oratorios as part of, to be performed as part of religious services. The fact that many of the audience, maybe most of the audience that goes to listen to his music, doesn't share his religious beliefs is simply uh, a, a change in interpretation. It doesn't mean that the, uh, the, the interpretations are not there. And the, the use of art uh, to support religious doctrine or political ideology, or today the power of corporations or the power of political leaders, that remains absolutely central and the, the real trick and the real danger, and this takes you back to, to the difference between culture and art, the real trick and the real danger is when you can persuade people that your interpretation is normal and that every other interpretation is a deviation from the norm. That's what culture does. Culture says this is normal. It is normal for us in our village to gather uh, outside, to lay out tables and to, to have a meal together uh, as as a community and that is so normal nobody even asks why do we do this and that is true of so many of the things that that structure our societies and our world and art allows us enables us to ask questions about some of those things and that becomes a matter of interpretation and it is contested so that is the heart of why this is so important, why it has always been so important. Here is an example from America. From, uh, it's a very recent example. This is a mural uh, created by the Vermilion Mural Collective by the artist Reina Hernandez and Amber Hansen and others. Uh, it was created, uh, the, the, panel, the, the panel with the wave breaking that you can see on the right hand side of the building was created before the pandemic. The other half was created last year under pandemic conditions. This is, Vermilion is a small town, a university town in South Dakota, um, uh, a, a, a rural state in the north, northern Midwest, a small population, but a, a, a strong uh, heartland of indigenous peoples of um, uh, of North America, the Lakota people in particular. And the artists who painted this were uh, principally people, women of color, uh, indigenous uh, um, people uh, who were members of the indigenous community. To, 
to make this painting representing uh, only women of color, indigenous women, representing uh, Lakota uh, stories and myths and symbols uh, is a significant statement and creation of meaning in an area which largely uh, is uh, votes for uh, Republican and conservative uh, um, political uh, leadership. And the process of negotiating permission and the iconography of this uh, image is uh, a process of, I would say, cultural democracy. It's the process of a community coming together to discuss and to negotiate and to agree what it is possible to say what meanings it is possible to say and bring into the public space. Part of that, which I wouldn't, uh, I didn't know, and it was the artist who who uh, told me, the two uh, the two figures, the two young women who are holding up the name of the of the uh, painting, which is a, a Lakota word, which I I won't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce. The two young figures who are standing holding that up. That is uh, a scene, they are holding um, the line between tr the tradi tradition and future, as you can perhaps see from their, the way they are dressed. But it's also an image taken from uh, the uh, Beyonce uh, uh, visual album called Lemonade, which uh, Reina Hernandez uh, is, feels is a masterpiece. And so there are layers of meaning and interpretation here, all of which are planned and intended. And the creation of this work and its continued presence in Vermilion is part of that uh, creation of meaning and the questioning. This is art questioning culture. It is questioning Lakota culture, it is questioning indigenous culture, but it is also questioning global culture. For instance, uh, it's impossible to see the wave behind the central figure on the on the the right-hand panel without thinking of Hokusai and asking what is the connection between a 19th century uh, Japanese printmaker uh, and, and this place and, and these cultures, but also the, the, uh, the colonial culture and the post-colonial culture that is uh, now uh, the makeup of South Dakota's mixed uh, um, communities. So, is art a human right? I hope you will see that from what I have been speaking about, given the importance of art as a power in society and as a way to create meaning, then I think uh, it follows that it must be a human right. This image, by the way, is from a, uh, created by a wonderful group of mostly older people living in South London called Entelechy Arts, who are a remarkably uh, uh, creative and, and um, interesting group of people. None of them is a professional artist, uh, but they are all uh, in different ways, very gifted and committed artists. Uh, and they made this image to advertise the, the weekly film night they, they do in their, in their community center. So is art a human right? It has been since 1948 in article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. It's the first half of that that has always interested me. Everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community. What does that mean? Well, I think everything that I've been showing and this image are examples of people freely participating in the cultural life of the community. But I need to unpack what participating in the cultural life of the community means. And to look at how practically art can change lives. Last year I worked on the Rome, the 2020 Rome Charter. Um, and I tried to think through what it actually means, as we said in the Rome Charter, to participate fully and freely in the cultural life that's vital to our cities and communities. And the answer I came up with, that it is by helping us gain capabilities. 
That's how art practically can help us change our lives. What do I mean by capabilities? Well, here I'm following uh, in the footsteps of uh, the economist Amartya Sen and the philosopher Martha Nussbaum. Martha, Martha Nussbaum uh, defines them like this. She says, capabilities are the answers to the question, what is this person able to do and to be? And that is maybe the most fundamental question we all have about ourselves. What, what can I do? What am I able to do? And what can I be? Who can I be? She goes on to explain, they are not just abilities residing inside a person, but also the freedoms or opportunities created by a combination of personal abilities and the political, social and economic environment. So we all have abilities or disabilities. Um, no matter how much I dreamed of it, I would not be able to be an airline pilot. There are lots of reasons, mostly I'm not clever enough, but the most basic reason is however hard I studied, however hard I tried, I cannot pass the sight test for, to be an airline pilot. My eyesight is not good enough to allow me to be an airline pilot. That is the political, social and economic environment that prevents me from being an airline pilot. Now, I think it's a very good prevention. I would not like anybody with my poor eyesight to fly me in an aeroplane. Thank you very much. So I accept that. On the other hand, the political, social and economic environment, for example, which prevented women from graduating from universities in the UK until very recently, uh, was clearly not uh, anything to do with the abilities of women, which is why women now go to university and graduate and often uh, exceed uh, the achievements of their male fellow students. So capabilities are things that are not just our innate abilities, the skills or capacities or talents that we have, but they are the context the social, political, economic environment that says, can we fulfill, can we use our abilities or not? Can we fulfill our potential or not? And that's what has always concerned me as a community artist. I have, was fortunate to, to be born into uh, a privileged context in the late, well, the middle of the 20th century as a white man uh, in a middle-class family, uh, I had enormous advantages, many more advantages than most people born on this planet uh, have had. My work in community arts has always been about trying to ensure that at least in art, because I know there are limits to how much I can change the world, but at least in art, I can work to help other people have the same advantages that I had. In other words, the same freedoms and opportunities. And that has sometimes meant challenging the political, social and economic environment in which I'm living. But it has always meant using my skills to help people achieve the best that they can with their abilities. That's why I showed you the picture of Anna Francis at the beginning. She, in her neighbourhood, is working with young people and adults to enable them to have the freedoms and opportunities to make art and consequently to create interpretations and meanings that she has had. I want to share you, I want to share a, a little video that we made for the, uh, to explain some of this for the Rome Charter. What is culture for? Have you ever thought about that? It's everything we do beyond mere survival. It gives meaning to our perceptions. It brings humanity together through emotions, imagination, thoughts, 
a group of over 40 cities started an online initiative to advance the right to take part in cultural life as an essential condition for a better society. We're launching a global proposal to promote everyone's right to discover, enjoy, create, share, protect, and participate in culture. It lies at the root of all our connections and in our common future on this planet. Sharing a rich cultural life together empowers us to face challenges and crises and is vital for the rebirth of our cities and communities. So in thinking through what it means to be able to participate in the cultural life of the community, I propose five capabilities. In other words, the things that everybody should be able to do in their relationship with culture in order to fulfill their abilities. And you heard those at the end of the film. They are discover, enjoy, create, share, and protect. And they are deliberately simple and clear. I wanted to offer a set of a framework for ideas that anyone could understand and remember. And that is part of the moral contract that a state or a cultural institution can make with the people it serves. That in cultural terms, in ensuring that they have the cultural, the right to participate in the cultural life of the community, we should all be able to discover, enjoy, create, share, and protect our culture. We may not want to do all of those things. We may not want to do all of them at the same time in our life or for the same reasons or to the same degree. But the important thing is that we should have those capabilities. And I'll conclude this talk by talking through what I mean by those capabilities. So by discover, I mean simply, and this may happen most as a child, but it can happen at any point in life, discovering what your culture is, who you are, what is your inheritance, what is the Tradition, cultural tradition and world in which you're going to be brought up by your parents or by the adults who care for you? What is the culture of the society that you belong to? And crucially, what is the culture of the other people in this world? You have the right to, dis to be able to be enabled to discover that. And this is an image from a project called Fun Palaces, which is a huge grassroots led campaign to enable people to discover and to share their cultural uh, knowledge. But that culture is also about discovering other people's culture. This is an image from a project in, in France called Banlieue Bleu, with, which is a jazz festival, but does a lot of work with young people. And in this image, you can see on the left-hand side, uh, a, a, an American poet, rapper, musician called Napoleon Maddox, and a young boy from uh, Clichy Soubois, whose name I unfortunately don't know. They were working on uh, the creation of, of uh, um, artistic performance together, musical performance, and they don't speak the same language. Uh, Napoleon Maddox doesn't speak French, the boy didn't speak English, but they are discovering each other, they are discovering each other's culture and each other's potential, and they are just about to agree to make something together. The second capability is to enjoy. Unless art is enjoyable, it has no purpose. We have, it has to enrich us, it has to give us pleasure and happiness. This is an image from a newly revived uh, tradition in the Netherlands called the St. Martin Parade, which is a huge coming together in Utrecht of people uh, to create uh, light sculptures which they process on St. Martin's Day through the streets of the city and bring together all of the different 
communities of Utrecht. Everyone can participate. And it is a, a, a glorious and beautiful moment, an evening, where everybody works on uh, for weeks beforehand to create their objects, only for the sole purpose of enjoying this moment of collective um, uh, beauty. A different example from Warsaw, uh, Poland, the, the new Jewish museum uh, that was opened a few years ago, and a choir that has been associated with it and is regularly performing music uh, as part of, of the program of that uh, institution. And again, this is a different kind of enjoyment, but the enjoyment of being able to perform and to sing uh, and to be part of this, this experience. Create. We are not only recipients of culture, we are also the creators of it. Unless we are able to create the meanings and interpretations that are meaningful to us, we cannot be full citizens in a democracy. That's why it's a human right. This is an image from a performance called This Is Not For You. By uh, a theater, It was created by a theatre company called Grey Eye, which is the first uh, UK theatre company uh, of disabled uh, artists. It was, will celebrate its 40th anniversary this year. And this was a, a play that they uh, created with 25 disabled ex-service people, men and women, uh, the person at the forefront you can see is a man called Jez Scarrett, who was a former Marine and is now an amputee of his right leg. That's what it says on his T-shirt. As part of this theatre performance, he's currently wearing a label that says 50%, which shows the amount of his pension that he's entitled to for the injury that he has sustained. This is a very powerful piece of theatre made by a group of veterans who feel that they are forgotten. And the title of the piece came from one of the veterans because on the Remembrance Day service on the 11th of November, he was attending a war memorial and somebody shouted at him. I should, I should have said he, he was a, uh, a wheelchair user. He was attending the, the memorial service at the war memorial in his town and somebody shouted at him, hey you, this is not for you, this is for the dead. It's a very powerful statement by these men and women who want to not be forgotten, who, who sacrifice for their country, they want remembering and they use theater to tell their story that right to be able to create and share their work is fundamental. A very different style. This is from the music festival in Setubal, which began in 2011 and has a huge procession at the start of it. Setubal in Portugal is a port city, a very diverse city, as you can see. And they have made their their music festival about song and uh, particularly uh, about the diverse cultures of the city. They've also taken uh, ecological protection as a theme. And because this is not a rich community or a rich city, uh, they have developed a tradition of using handmade percussion instruments made out of uh, recycled, uh, uh, thrown away objects. So they are creating music that has all kinds of political meanings and interpretations in something as simple as a parade of several hundred young people through the streets to open the festival. Share. It's one thing to be able to create your own culture, but you also need to be able to share it with others. Otherwise, the meanings, the interpretations that you have created are still born. This is an image from a project in Portugal, a photographic project that was, uh, the project worked with young offenders uh, detained in youth prisons in Portugal. And they worked with them to um, enable them to make photographs with little homemade pinhole cameras. So that the, the young men 
made pinhole cameras and then were able to take photographs. This is a particularly moving example. Um, it doesn't need me to interpret it. But the crucial thing is that the images that they then made were uh, uh, exhibited in galleries in their own towns. And they were therefore able to take a place alongside other artists and to be able to share their vision. These young men who are in effect silenced and excluded from society simply by being detained in a prison were able to speak and to share their feelings and their interpretations to say what mattered to them through the medium of photography being shown in galleries. This is another different example, but this takes you back to the city I talked about in the beginning, Stoke, a city which is rebuilding itself, a performance called You Are Here, which was celebrating the different people who now live in Stoke, the people who have migrated there, some to seek work, some to escape war, some for family or sentimental reasons. And these are all people who told their stories in a specially created performance that they worked on together, that they then were able to share with their neighbours and with the, the, the wider population of the city. And finally, protect. And this is the capability that I've often been, I've most often been challenged on or questioned about, because it seems as if it might be hostile. It's certainly open to interpretations, but it recognizes the reality that our culture is not always accepted or welcome to others. Culture is contested. Art is contested. But human beings contest everything. It's simply that the meanings, the interpretations we create are not always agreed with. Merely by somebody putting the pronouns that they wish to be known by in their social media profile can become a site of contestation. This image is an image from a project called Family Treasures Revealed, a very simple project where an artist worked with some women who had migrated to the UK to make some work that they could share with their families, with their children and with each other, that showed something about the culture that maybe they were worried they might lose now that they lived in a completely different world, a completely different culture. When we are a minority, sometimes our cultural traditions, our language, our food, our dress, these things can be really important to us because they're wrapped up in our identity. And much as we are, we like and are happy to live in a new world, we don't want to live in this new country if that means that we're not allowed to retain our existing language or our existing traditions. But equally, in the new country, people may feel that their traditions and cultures are threatened by the changes in the people they see around them. Culture, I talked earlier about in, in the mural in South Dakota and the presence of indigenous women of color in that mural. And I use the phrase cultural democracy. Cultural democracy is the space and the processes by which we can learn to negotiate and to understand and to hear each other and to learn to empathize, learn to use our imagination, learn to understand that actually the fact someone else wants to keep their language or their culture alive is not a threat to me and the fact that I want to keep my language and culture alive doesn't need to be a threat to them. And this is an example from a project I worked on in Bulgaria about 20 years ago. Um, uh, the revival of traditional Catholic uh, music and dance in a small uh, town in central Bulgaria. There are very few Catholic communities in Bulgaria. And of course, under the communist period, these traditions had been stifled. And the project that I uh, was a able to, to help 
uh, through a program called Living Heritage, precisely connected teenagers and grandparents who did not have a particularly good relationship in this town. The teenagers were bored and had nothing to do. The grandparents would walk past them and feel intimidated by them, but by working together to revive their cultural traditions that only the grandparents remembered, but that the teenagers could take pride in and confidence in, they created uh, not just one, but two dance uh, groups in the in the cities in the city and were able to to create a festival and to invite the other catholic uh, villages uh, in their re region to come and take part in so this protecting and celebrating their own cultural traditions and integrity and identity is fundamental to all of us and our challenge is to do it in ways that is not threatening to others but actually encourages empathy and understanding across the differences and divides. So I'll finish there and simply say that uh, on this website, arrestlessart.com, you can find information about a lot of the examples I've shown. You can also find um, a book which describes and talks, explains a lot of the things I've been talking about and leave you with this final thought in response to the question of does art produce social change? If art were not a powerful force, it would matter less who controls it. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this and listen to me. I think we need everyone. Um, if you, if you want, if it's your birthday, you. Maybe you want to go out for a meal. You go to the best restaurant you can afford, who has the most talented chef who makes the food that you like. It doesn't mean that you, the food you cook at home is not nice. It doesn't mean that the food your friends cook for you and invite you around to eat is not nice. Um, we, have different, we have different talents. The, the art world protects itself by pretending talent is a fixed thing and uh, it's universal. But first of all, you have to ask which talents does it recognize? There are lots of people who have many talents that are not valued by the art world. They're creative talents, but you know, they, they may be an extraordinary embroiderer, or, but that's not seen to be valuable. But or at least it isn't until it's 200 years old, then we'll go and see it in a, in a, as an object of embroidery in a museum, but we'll, we won't consider the person who made it as an artist with a, with a story, with a narrative of their own um, and a personality of their own in the way that if that person was a painter, we would. Um, so talent is, it's back to the, the, the distinction between of capabilities, the division of capabilities between abilities, our innate things that we can, we're either good at or not good at, and the environment that allows or doesn't allow us to full, to make the most of our abilities. Um, so I, I think talent, I'm, I'm a great admirer of talent. I just think it's much more varied and, uh, diverse than most of the art world things and secondly that there is a lot more talent there but mostly you don't know about it because it doesn't uh it the the social political economic environment in which the person who has that talent is living doesn't enable them you know when i often used to think about there's a I used to think about the, the, the young artists, writers, musicians, composers who died in the First World War, because, and there are a lot of them then, because there was such a nationalist uh, rush to enlist that many young artists joined. So we, we, have, we know that that talent was destroyed because they had already started composing or writing poetry or whatever. But then I think 
how many given that most most of of our great artists have come from a very small section of society i i think how many uh, of how many more great artists have we missed you know when i talk about the women who didn't get to university now we in the last 100 years we have had women who have pioneered all sorts of scientific and intellectual and philosophical and artistic innovations because they were enabled to go to university so you think well how much have we lost in history by not enabling all those women before the 20th century to be educated 